All right, cool. So here we go, folks. Uh, welcome to another Psalm University webinar. Uh, remember, we're the Special Operations Medic Coalition. Uh, we unapologetically support the military special operations medical community. So we do this by our mission and vision, and we have some objectives. So Psalm C, we envision every special operations medic is having the resources necessary to enhance their capabilities, career, and their community. Our mission is to advocate for those special operations medic and assist in their transition from battlefield to provider to veteran professional. We get that done by our career capabilities and community departments. So all the opinions and comments are those of the speaker and do not represent the US military, DOD, or any particular organization. Psalm C has no financial disclosures to declare from Scratch Labs. Obviously, Dr. Lim has financial disclosures with Scratch Labs. Uh, so what's Psalm U? Psalm University, uh, it's our effort to focus on special operations medics capabilities and career. And it's one of our best ways that we assist people with transition and community and networking. So as you see there, there's some of our partners uh, with Psalm C and how we get this done. Our community objective, uh, we do that with con connection, advocacy, and support. Pictured below is when we supported uh, our New York team that was up at Ryan Larkin Field Hospital. We try and give everybody some content. So we do these webinars monthly. We do a podcast. We drop all our webinars that they let us on YouTube. If you're a member, you can engage in the forum, the blog. I do a weekly journal club every week where we break down evidence-based medical research, a monthly newsletter, and then we have our drive on the website. We're working on some education grants. Uh, we have the Education Ambassador Program. If you're looking to get a mentor to help you get to the next step in your professional career, and we care about the people that do one of the hardest jobs in the world. Uh, if you remember, you get access to lots of things we've already gone over. And we have a great board. We're all over the world. And without further ado, we're going to introduce uh, Dr. Alan Lim, who is the founder of Scratch Labs and a world-renowned doctor who helps with many teams in the Tour de France and is one of the most uh, intelligent people we know on performance nutrition. So we're super honored to have you here, uh, Dr. Lim, and I'm going to hand it all over to you. Hello. Can you guys hear me now? Oh, yeah. All right. I was just saying uh, thank you very much for having me and thank you for your service. It's definitely an honor for me to be here today and to talk to you guys about uh, sports nutrition, performance nutrition, and um, everything that that entails. Uh, with that in mind, this is a pretty complex topic on one hand, because there's so much information out there and that information can be really confusing and it can be all over the place. And there is so much conflicting information, I think in part because we all have our own opinions and we all have our own experiences and we're also all individuals. And so in trying to frame, how do you talk about sports nutrition in such a short period of time to so many people? Um, it, it, this was, something that was kind of tweaking my head a bit because uh, there is no real easy way to go about this. And so what I want to do today is first and foremost, answer specific questions that you guys have. Um, I often find it a lot easier just to have someone ask me a question and for us to have a discussion about it and to weigh all the different pros and cons because I don't think that there are any absolutes when it comes to how we fuel and hydrate ourselves to optimize our performance, right? Um, especially in field settings, especially when people might be hurt or injured, et cetera, right? And especially given the very specific demands that you guys all have out in the field. Um, you know, my perspective tends to be one that is very, very pragmatic, right? And also very, very specific. So I care more about the outcome and I care more about logistics than I do about theory, right? Um, and it's with that frame of reference that I bring a lot of what I experience working with uh, professional athletes, especially at, you know, really intense events like the Tour de France uh, to the table. Uh, with that in mind, uh, here's what I'm going to uh, try to cover today. And uh, one thing that I do want from all of you is if you have any questions, just chime in, just throw it out there, just ask the question, um, stop me, you know, et cetera. We do have plenty of time from what I understand, right? What's our time limit? Oh, um, uh, we have till 6.30 holy. EST, so. so. We got 90, we got 90 minutes Tons. Uh, to, to talk over this stuff. So the presentation I have will hopefully only be about half of that or a component of that. 
Uh, but here's what uh, I'm going to try to cover uh, today, and then we're going to spend a lot of time with um, Q and A. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about performance uh, nutrition today, and uh, this is the way I'm going to break it up. I'm going to spend about 80% of this just talking about some big picture ideas, some of the things that I feel are really, really important when it comes to nutrition, especially sports nutrition, that nobody ever freaking talks about because all we end up talking about is carbohydrate, fat, protein, sodium, water, blah, 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 blah. And it gets, I don't know, it gets off track. We're gonna do some basic physiology review and I'm gonna basically present only two pieces of physiology that I want you guys to really, really understand. One is GI physiology, right? The other is the movement of water and nutrients across different body compartments. So from the small intestine into the bloodstream, into the interstitial fluid, into cells and back and forth and what that interplay looks like. And if we can get that physiology nailed, then anything we talk about with respect to hydration and fueling starts to make more sense. And we can use that as a foundation to, for me to just go over general notions or thoughts that I believe help athletes in the field, okay? Everybody on board, makes sense? All right, awesome. Um, here's the deal about nutrition as a whole. And I think that this is uh, a great quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald who wrote The Great Gatsby that surmises it, sum summarizes it uh, really, really well. And his quote is that, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in one's mind and still retain the ability to function, right? Which is to say that so much of what we discuss around nutrition and performance contradicts itself, right? And if you're going to be able to function and figure out what is best for you and the people that you work with, you're going to have to live with that contradiction. And one of the biggest pieces of contradiction when it comes to health and performance is this idea called hormesis. Anybody know what hormesis means? This is big picture thoughts right now about sports and nutrition. Anyone, hormesis, throw it out there. All right, five second rule. Not just for uh, picking up food off the ground, but for answering my Socratic questions. Uh, hormesis is this idea that something that might be good for you in a small amount in a large dose may actually kill you, right? This is uh, stuff from Paracelsus, who was kind of the father of toxicology, the father of modern medicine. And he realized that, you know, there were many drugs and things that uh, might aid us, that might help us, but that if you overdosed, right, if the dose response curve wasn't right, you could actually kill someone. There is no better example of hormesis than food and drink, right? We obviously need food to survive. We obviously need drink to survive. But if we overconsume, we die, right? And this is the essential paradox, the essential contradiction that I think rules not just all of nutrition, but all of physiology. Another great example of hormesis is our training response or our training adaptation, right? If we want to get stronger, we have to stress out the body. But if we stress out the body too much, we end up overreaching, overtraining, and our performance declines, right? And vice versa, if we don't do enough workload, we don't get that effective dose, we're gonna be crap, right? Um, the next contradiction in nutrition is this idea of uh, thinking about our food from a technocentric perspective versus an ethnocentric perspective. Um, when I was in graduate school, you know, everything that I learned about food and nutrition came from a technocentric perspective or came from what we think of as a reductionist form of thinking where we break everything down into its parts. How much carbohydrate, how much fat, how much protein, how much sugar, how much sodium, how much of this micronutrient versus that micronutrient. Will this phytochemical improve my performance? Will taking beets actually increase my blood flow, right? 
blah, 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 all of this reductionism. And it's a very technical way of thinking about what we put in our bodies. Americans as a whole are the most technocentric people on the planet. We always want progress. We always want innovation. We always want to break down all the little parts. But the reality is, is that in almost every other country in the world, the way that food works and the way that sports nutrition works is through an ethnocentric lens, meaning that it's the lens of culture, the lens of what your mom fed you, right? So when I go home and I visit my mom in LA and she sits me down and she puts a bowl of noodles in front of me, I don't ask her what the nutrient profile is going to look like. I just shut my mouth and I eat that bowl of noodles, right? And what's very interesting is that when I started working internationally with pro cyclists, I had athletes from all over the world and they all had their own belief system passed on from their own culture about what they needed to eat to perform really well. Even if we didn't agree, the big learning lesson for me was, was maybe twofold. First, that as long as they were happy with what they ate, they still performed at this remarkable level. And so what I was able to see um, at the Tour de France was I was able to observe athletes from all types of cultures, eating in all types of ways, still getting incredible, incredible performance out of, out of themselves, right? And all of a sudden, this notion of a right technocentric way of eating started to kind of fall apart for me. It made me realize the second idea, which is that it's probably easier to change a person's religion than it is to change how they eat, right? That being said, we're gonna to try to give you some education to help get you guys on track or keep you guys on track. Ultimately, you know, from a very pragmatic standpoint, this is kind of the big debate between science versus practice, right? You know, science, uh, evidence-based problem solving, uh, looking at the facts, looking at the details, but then being out in the field and asking yourself, well, what's practical, what's logistically possible, what's pragmatic for, for, for me in this situation right now, and being in tune enough with your own needs and your surroundings to be able to adapt. And I think adaptation with respect to your diet is probably going to be one of the primary things that, that keeps you uh, performing well and also healthy. You know, with that in mind, again, the paradox, the contradiction of the quantified self and how we are now living in a culture where we probe every, you know, possible variable that we can in our body from, you know, heart rate variability to our power output to our core temperature, yada, 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 to our sodium sweat concentration versus our quality of self, which is maybe just stepping back and asking the question, how are you, right? How you doing? How you feeling, right? Um, you know, I, I think that over the years, if, if I've learned anything, it's simply to ask that question. And so if you were to do a nutrition consultation with me, you know, here's what would probably happen. I'd ask you for a, a excessive amount of money, some obscene, you know, kind of uh, uh, price. Uh, I'd take out a piece of paper and on one side, I'd ask you uh, to list all the foods that make you feel like shit. And then on the other side, I'd ask you to list out all the foods that make you feel great. Uh, you pass that piece of paper back to me and I would look at it. I would hem and a haw and I would, you know, make different noises that would connote that I was really interested in what you had written down. And then I would take a big Sharpie and on the side of the paper where it said foods that make me feel like crap, I would write, don't eat this shit. And then on the other side where you had written down foods that make me feel great, I'd write down, eat these foods instead. And our consultation would be done and you would be a happy camper. I guarantee it. Um, so it brings me to this idea is that as much as I consider myself to be a scientist, as much as reading the scientific literature is important and you guys have access to a journal club, right? Which is freaking phenomenal. You got to remember that science tries to break everything down to an average, right? And that you all ultimately are individuals who have to make your own grown up decisions about what you put in your body, right? On average, core temperature is about 37.5 degrees Celsius. But if I were to put your head under fire, and I were to put your lower body under ice, I could probably create a situation where on average, you were normal, you were normal body temperature. But this would also be some form of grotesque torture and you might be dead, right? 
So on average doesn't necessarily, you know, account for what is actually happening. Uh, more importantly, I think, I imagine, I assume that you all want to be better than average, right? That you all want to be outliers. And so the real question is, how do we gain information? How do we experiment? How do we test? How do we work together to actually raise that average and not be average? What I think is that, at least pragmatically in practice, for me, it's always been about bottlenecks, not marginal gains. And there's a lot that you're gonna see in the world of nutrition. There's a lot of marketing out there that is basically gonna say, take this like this and you're going to perform this much better because we're going to unlock some sort of little marginal gain right um you know consume x amount of dietary nitrates which then turn into nitrites which under the right circumstance like say hypoxia will release nitric oxide which might improve the vasodilation of blood flow going to that hypoxic tissue yeah maybe that seems fair, but you got to ask yourself, is that the bottleneck? Is that what is holding you back? Is how many beets you ate that morning really the bottleneck? Or is it that your refrigerator is actually empty because you haven't gone shopping for food in like two weeks, right? What is the real bottleneck? You know, is the performance bottleneck that um, you don't know exactly what nutrients to put in your body? Or is the bottleneck that you spend most of your time eating by yourself? right? And you eat the same shit over and over and over again, right? You know, with that in mind, um, on the pro tour, I found myself, despite all of the knowledge I knew, really trading my lab coat in for an apron, right? And in many ways, I was less of a sports scientist than I was, you know, basically a um, really educated nanny of sorts, right? And as that highly educated nanny, if shit was hitting the fan and you know things were getting emotional or we weren't accomplishing what we were needing to accomplish, not getting the job done, whatever it was, whatever was getting in the way, I would always tell the athletes I worked with to halt. And halt stood for, are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Are you tired, right? If they're hungry, we fed them. If they're angry, we talked it out. If they're lonely, we got in a big cuddle puddle with a bunch of puppies. And if they're tired, we went to bed, right? And it's interesting that when I think of performance nutrition and I think about the world of sports nutrition, I really think about HALT. I really think about the same technique that you could use to take care of a three-year-old when it comes to taking care of an elite performer. And I, I know that that itself is a contradiction and doesn't, Maybe um, maybe it, it discounts the, the the quality of science in the field right now, but we do have to remember that we are human, right? And that there are very simple ways to take care of our very complex beings. That in many ways we are all very complicated people, but our needs are very very simple. You know, with that in mind, it's interesting because I came into the world of professional cycling at a time where everybody was on the guacamole. And when I say guacamole, I don't mean like, you know, the guacamole you put on nachos. I'm talking about the guacamole you inject with a syringe. And we used to just call it the guac. And we used to, you know, ask ourselves and our, our competitors like, you know, I wonder how many avocados that guy's using in his guac. I wonder how much salt he's putting in his guac. I wonder, you know, if he's actually you know, eating his guac with nachos, you know, does he put his guac on a sandwich or does he just like eat his guac plain? Like, how's this done? And what, what, I, what I found when I got in the pro cycling was that guys were so addicted to drugs. They were so addicted to performance that for the most part, they just medicated and isolated, right? Um, it was an epidemic, right? And this began to teach me a lot about, I guess, nutrition, because when I first got to Europe, I remember landing at, uh, at you know, the athlete that I was assigned to coach. And, um, you know, he was a world-class cyclist. You know, he would go on to quote unquote, win the Tour de France. 
Um, but the first night that I got there, I remember walking in after 20 some odd hours of travel to Europe uh, from the States and being super hungry. And the first question he asked me was, hey, are you hungry? You want something to eat? And I was like, hell yeah, I'm so hungry. You know, let's go get something to eat. Let's enjoy the, the great food of Catalan where we're at. And he goes into the kitchen and he opens up the, the, you know, the pantry and he pulls out this box of, box of Lucky Charms and starts pouring me this bowl of cereal. And at that moment, I was like, oh my goodness, we are all totally screwed, you know, because that was our construct of performance nutrition. What's interesting is that that construct was really built on the fact that he was mostly medicating and isolating, right? It was built on the construct of, of, of loneliness. And, you know, maybe the most important lesson that I learned in those early years of pro cycling is I was trying to figure a way to get this whole culture back on its feet was that loneliness and this isolation was not only hurting our performance, but it was hurting our relationship with food and drink. Um, it's really interesting. If you look at, say, something like the Framingham Heart Study, which is the longest, epi, uh, the longest ongoing study on heart disease in America, you find that, uh, for example, cigarettes is one of the most predictive factors for determining whether or not you're going to have a heart attack or heart disease as a whole. But next to cigarette smoking is self reported loneliness. And that's highly associated with whether or not someone is eating by themselves. What's really interesting is that while loneliness may be as important of a factor, it doesn't come with a warning label the way that cigarettes do, right? And so there are other things when we talk about bottlenecks that might be intruding on one's performance that I think are important to note. At least culturally for me, this is what I found. And as I was thinking about this, um, I ended up writing a grant to the World Anti-Doping Agency to begin to look at biological markers associated with drug use to try to help clean up the culture. And the person that I began to work with was a guy named Don Catlin at the UCLA Anti-Doping Laboratory. And Don Catlin was this interesting character because he was um, an army doctor who in 1984 was assigned to set up the first anti-doping lab for the 1984 Los Angeles Games. But for the most part, he spent most of his career working for the US military. And he was a Vietnam War era physician. And his primary job was working with soldiers coming back from Vietnam who were addicted to heroin, right? And as we began working on, on, on this system of looking for biological markers for drugs, a system that would become something known as the biological passport, he told me the story about his work in Vietnam and about this idea called the Skinner box, right? The Skinner box um, is this model for studying our own bio biology and uh, maybe kind of our wants, our needs, maybe our addictions. And in this model of the Skinner box, you've got a rat who's isolated in the cage, who's given the option to drink plain water versus the option to drink water laced with, say, cocaine, right? And when you put a rat in a cage and you give them this, these two options, you know what this rat does, this mouse does? It drinks almost exclusively the water laced with cocaine. It's always high. In fact, it gets so high for so long that it will stop eating food, it will stop taking care of itself, it'll stop grooming, and it'll eventually just die, right? And Dr. Catlin explained to me that this was the basis of why they thought that drug use had this biological component to it, because it was such a strong drive that we would die before we would stop using it after our brain became addicted to it, right? But then he explained this other idea called Rat Park put forth by a Canadian psychologist named Bruce Alexander. And in Rat Park, what you do is you create this thriving environment for uh, these rats, for these, for these mice. They can play, they can socialize, they can do whatever they want. This is like a dream come true. And you give it the option for plain water or water laced with cocaine. And what's really interesting is they primarily drink water. They, they use a bit of cocaine on Friday nights, but beyond that, they uh, mostly drink water. Um, yeah. 
it's really interesting that in that environment, they don't become addicted. In fact, you can take an addicted mouse and you can put it in Rat Park and it will rehabilitate itself. And Dr. Catlin's notion was, hey, look, here's the deal. The only way that I could help soldiers when they came back from Vietnam to get healthy again was to find a way to integrate them into their community. And his statement to me, at least from maybe a performance standpoint, from a nutrition standpoint, was the only way that you're really going to clean the sport up is if you re-engage them and create that community as well and create that community, hopefully around food, right? Um, it's interesting because when you think about that, there are these other paradoxes, like the French paradox that says, hey, you can smoke, you can eat cheese, you can drink wine, and you can have a healthy heart, right? And for me, what it came down to was this idea called commensality. Commensality, calm meaning with, mensa meaning table, itty, the act of is literally the act of sitting down and eating at the table with one another. And so for me, the only way that we could make things work, that we could actually not just get these guys to stop using performance enhancing drugs, right? Um, but to deploy sports nutrition that actually made them healthier and better was to make them sit down at the dinner table together, right? And so for the teams that I work with, it became mandatory uh, to show up to team meals, right? It became mandatory that if we were at an event or a race that you were not late for dinner, that we always ate together, that you were never allowed to eat by yourself, right? It's so interesting to me that outside of all of the science that I may have learned and all of the, all of the different ergogenic aids that I might have tried, that this was probably the most important sports nutrition, I guess, um, feature uh, that I ever executed in my career was just making you know, grown adults sit down at the freaking dinner table to, with one another. And I think it had real biological relevance, right? And so at a big race like the Tour de France, we started to actually build out our own food trucks. We started hiring really great chefs to bring to these races. Logistics and execution became more of the bottleneck and more of the process and what was it that we were going to feed the athletes, right? You got to take care of that first. It does uh, kind of start more at, at a higher level in terms of thinking about those logistics. You know, ultimately, it's the parable of stone soup, right? It's the idea that we're all part of a big community, um, that we can all bring something to that soup, that you need a lot of variety, uh, not just in your social connections, but also in the food that we eat, and that we, as individuals, especially in American culture that is so highly individualistic, we kind of think that it all depends on ourselves. But one of the things I wanted to remind you guys about sports nutrition was that you can rely on each other and you can work together to create an environment, a daily performance environment where everyone is bringing a little bit to the table to help make it work. So even though we're going to do some education about physiology, we're going to talk about your individual needs, et cetera, that, you know, I espouse thinking yourself as an individual and not relying necessarily on the average. Ultimately, we have to be able to do this together. And that's another, I think, sports nutrition lesson that is missing right now in the conversation. Finally, you know, big picture. It's a no shit Sherlock pragmatism, pragmatic kind of viewpoint. But if you're looking at a pile of shit through a magnifying glass, I'm here to tell you that it's probably a pile of shit. And that being pragmatic about how you think about food is really important. Back to the idea of a nutritional consultation with the Sharpie. Something makes you feel like crap, ask yourself why, right? And start to account for that. Something makes you feel good, start to account for that. You are going to be your own best scientific experiment when it comes to optimizing your performance with food and drink and community. And I'm here to tell you that it freaking matters. So no matter what it is you decide to do, or how you do it, it matters. It will change your performance more than any amount of guacamole you could ever have. 
Finally, I want to talk about blue zones before we get into some physiology, because I find this really, really interesting. And I find this interesting because there was a question that was thrown out, you know, I'm getting older. How do I change what I eat as I get older to maintain my performance? And I was like, oh man, I don't know. And there's no clear scientific evidence that I can see that points to a specific direction, but it made me think about blue zones. It made me think about blue zones. And I'll give you guys a little bit of background. Um, this idea of blue zones was took a lot of interest after this Danish twin study came out. It looked at like 2,000, almost 3,000 pairs of twins. And what they determined about longevity was that only about 20% of how long someone lived was determined by genetics. About 80% was actually lifestyle. And anthropologically, there are these different geographical areas with an extraordinarily high percentage of centenarians, people above the age of 100. Uh, the major locations of these blue zones are Loma Linda, California, uh, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Sardinia, Italy, uh, Akaria, Greece, and Okinawa, Japan. And folks here, um, they reach the age of 100 at about 10 times the rate uh, of the United States. So this is like a really, these are really, really weird geographical zones, right? One thing that is very interesting about these zones is that um, when it comes to at least food, people eat the same from birth to death, right? They don't modify their diet when they turn, you know, 40 or 50 or 60 or 70. They keep on trucking along. The other traits that are observed is that, you know, natural movement is part of daily life. They don't go to a gym. They don't, you know, get swole. They don't, you know, ride their bike 100 miles. They just walk and work the land, right? They're just always out there. They, they, natural movement is part of daily life. They have a strong sense of purpose. This um, Aikigai, it's this idea in Okinawa of why I wake up in the morning. Uh, they have a daily routine of relaxation. Every single day, there is some time that is set aside to just chill, to pray, to meditate, to take a nap. It's mostly plant-based diets. There is animal protein in almost all of these diets, but for the most part, most of their diet is made up of plants. Uh, they all have this characteristic of being about 80% full at the dinner table. Um, their meals take longer. They always eat together. So commensality is another trait. But the, the eating is more of a social ritual than it is a I'm going to satiate myself and get really full ritual. So 80% full. Um, and then this last group, sense of belonging, loved ones first, small core tribe. Um, they're, they're, they're all very um, similar in that they do have a strong sense of belonging. They do have a strong sense of community. They tend to have, you know, um, anywhere from three to five, you know, really close friends that they stay friends with their whole entire lives. So blue zones. Okay. That's all the big picture stuff I wanted to go over. Anybody have any questions before I get into some GI physiology and we actually do break things down into some of the at least basic science that I think people don't discuss when it comes to sports nutrition, like how does my butthole work so that we can actually not pee out of our buttholes when we're out in the field and trying to shove a bunch of sports drink down our gut, right? So any big picture questions or ideas? Anybody need to go take a, a pee right now? All right. We're going to keep on trucking on then. Okay. So um, this is my little drawing of the GI tract. All right. So bear with me. This is actually my drawing of the human body. Yeah, screw. This is not just the GI tract. This is how I think of the human body, this little drawing right here. So I'm going to just break this down uh, for you guys. First, top hole. That's where food and drink goes down. That's your mouth. Okay, and what you'll see is that it goes into this center tube, and this center tube is essentially your GI tract, and it's a continuous tube from your mouth to your butt that isn't actually part of your body, right? That whole tube is actually continuous with the environment. When you put something in your mouth, you're not actually putting it in your body, you're putting it in a tube 
that sits inside of your body, like one of those little water things that you slips through your hands, right? So you got your mouth, then you have your stomach, okay? So digestion begins when we start to chew food, when we put something in our mouth. In fact, digestion actually begins when we smell food. We begin to release digestive enzymes. Our, our body uh, changes. We get blood flow to our small intestine in anticipation of eating, of digestion, etc. cetera. Um, as we break down food, the enzyme amylase in our mouth begins to break down these simple long chain carbohydrates or starches, right? Um, you know, we mix it with water, we wet that food, it turns into what's called a bolus and it goes into our stomach. Our stomach is actually a big reservoir, right? It's a big reservoir that acid can enter to continue to break down food and that churns and ultimately liquefies everything we eat. But no absorption or very little absorption of foodstuffs, if any, occurs to the stomach. Some some drugs can cross the stomach, maybe a little bit of alcohol can cross the stomach, but for the most part, nothing crosses in the stomach. It's just a big, big mixing chamber of food that helps with digestion. Then you've got the small intestine below the stomach. And the small intestine is primarily where this digested chyme or liquid food now enters into the body, okay? You've got the colon below that where you have some water reabsorption and where fecal matter is made. And then feces comes out of your butt or your anus, right? What's really important to notice is that there is this feature in the small intestine, these microvilli, that's essentially this intestinal membrane, right? It's also known as a semi-permeable membrane. It's a membrane that selectively transports some items and not other items. So your small intestine has all of these different transport mechanisms that brings nutrients into the body and selectively keeps other things out of the body, like food coloring or chewing gum or you know chemicals that might be toxic to your body. The semi-permeable membrane is super important. Um, you know, it's the great facilitator of things. All these nutrients end up entering the bloodstream, right? Which is a part or a component of the body known as the extracellular space. It's about where one third of the body water is. The primary electrolyte here is sodium and chloride. And this extracellular space is made up of blood, the vascular space, which is only about five liters and the interstitial space, right? Which makes up the rest of the space. So here's the deal. When you eat, goes in your mouth, goes in your stomach, goes in your small intestine, goes across your small intestine into your bloodstream. Eventually those nutrients then go into your interstitial fluid and into body cells. And so one thing I wanna at least showcase in this mechanism is carbohydrate transport. Something to know about carbohydrate transport. And so now we're blowing up this section between the intestinal lumen, the intestine, and that vascular space to the interstitial space into this cellular space. There are many types of carbohydrates out there, right? There are different complex starches out there. There are simple sugars out there. Eventually, every single carbohydrate, if it's gonna be useful as energy for the body, has to be broken down by digestion into either glucose, galactose, or fructose. Right? So if you've got a potato, you have something that has a bunch of complex glucose molecules stuck together, either as a straight chain like a, like a, like a, like a choo-choo train or with these complex branches. Right? To get galactose, you basically have, a, you have, you have glucose um, and galactose, which make a, makes a molecule called lactose. You find that in milk. And so the enzyme lactase, if you have it, breaks down glucose and galactose, breaks down lactose into glucose and galactose, right? Um, if you have like say cane sugar, that's gonna be a combination of glucose and fructose, right? And there's an enzyme called sucrase that breaks that down. So you can actually mix and match all of these different types of 
simple sugars to get more complex carbohydrates, right? Um, you know, a glucose plus a glucose, if it's just two molecules, is called uh, maltose. Um, glucose and glucose, depending on you know, what chain is connected to what chain, if it's the four to four carbon, it's actually something called trehalose. It's really a bizarre little carbohydrate. Um, a super long straight chain of glucose might be considered between three and 20 glucose units, a maltodextrin, right? You start to add chains where uh, you branch this thing or turn it into a wreath, that could be another starch, an amylopectin. Um, so lots of different carbohydrates, but they eventually all get digested to these three basic forms. And in these three basic forms, there are only really two transporters that bring this stuff in, right? Galactose and glucose go through what's called an SGLT1 transporter. Fructose goes through what's called the GLUT5 transporter. What's very interesting is that glucose, through this sodium glucose transporter one system, actually is aided by sodium, right? And so you need a little bit of sodium, two molecules of sodium, one molecule of glucose or galactose to get this process going, right? And what's really, really interesting about this is that for every two molecules of sodium and one molecule of glucose that are transported, a water channel also opens up that moves over 260 water molecules. Um, this was actually uh, discovered by an army captain in the 1950s. And they realized they're using a pig model at the time that when they added sodium and glucose to a solution, that water moved across the small intestine faster than plain water alone. This became the basis of oral rehydration solutions like Pedialyte or like the wellness drink that we sell at Scratch. These are very high sodium, low glucose solutions, right? You have two molecules of sodium, only one molecule of glucose that significantly aids in water transport. To date, this discovery of sodium glucose transport one and the stoichiometry around sodium and glucose, this one discovery as a medical intervention has saved more lives than any other medical intervention ever discovered, right? Because what happens is if you have diarrhea, if you have an intestinal virus like cholera, the small intestine begins to break down and water starts to leak through into the intestinal lumen and you get diarrhea. That diarrhea is responsible for more deaths worldwide than any other disease. And it's not necessarily the diarrhea that kills people, it's the dehydration associated with that diarrhea. And so the clinical basis of dehydration from diarrhea has effectively informed us around the basis for why sports drinks require a little bit of sugar and some sodium in them and why these oral rehydration solutions that are now distributed by the World Health Organization are so vital to keeping people alive, especially after a big storm where water might be dirty and waterborne viruses might be more prevalent. Um, fructose, which mainly come, is a type of fruit sugar, right? High fructose corn syrup is ubiquitous. That goes through a GLUT5 transport mechanism, and that's uh, more of a facilitated uh, versus the SGLT1, which is called a co-transport mechanism, right? So long story short, you've got these specific doors to get both glucose and fructose in. To optimize carbohydrate absorption as a whole, what we have found, at least in practice with the athletes I've worked with, and there are a number of studies that also show this, having some combination of glucose and fructose speeds carbohydrate absorption faster than just either relying on something that is purely fructose or purely glucose. And depending upon what you decide to use and what you like in terms of taste, there are a lot of ways to skin that cat, right? Uh, for example, in our drink, we use a combination of cane sugar, which is sucrose and glucose with a little more glucose because there are slightly more SGLT1 transporters than there are GLUT5 transporters. And so we try to create a carbohydrate ratio that maximizes to that ratio of carbohydrate absor uh, you know, transporters. Anyways, Back to the gastrointestinal tract, right? 
we've got the mouth, the stomach, the small intestine, the colon, feces comes out the anus. We've got the semi-permeable membrane with both carbohydrate and facilitated transport or the, 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 the co-transport of water can also occur. You've got this extracellular space, you know, where your bloodstream is at, but also this interstitial space is at. And then you have this intracellular space, which is where we hold most of our water. We hold most of our water inside of cells, about 33 liters, two thirds of our total body water. One of the most important things that I want to showcase here is that when we talk about electrolytes, almost all of the electrolyte inside of a cell is potassium. And all of the electrolyte outside of the cell is just good old basic table salt or sodium chloride, right? So even though, you know, sodium chloride, potassium are important electrolytes along with say magnesium and calcium, and they all serve integral roles in our body, they don't necessarily commingle together. They live in different spaces, okay? The other thing I want you to take away from this image is that water in our body lives in different spaces as well. We hold most of our water inside of cells, but we also have water in our bloodstream and water outside of cells. And the reality is this, when it comes to blood pressure, when it comes to performance, when it comes to cardiac output, when it comes to you know whether or, some, or not someone who is bleeding is gonna die or not die, it all comes down to preserving this small five liter body water in the vascular space. Right. And so while we might be 70% water, most of that water lives inside of cells. It doesn't necessarily live in our bloodstream, but the water that we maintain in our bloodstream is probably more important to our performance and to our life than any other form of water. So when we start talking about hydration and dehydration, we're going to make this distinction between total body water dehydration versus a change in blood volume or plasma volume, right? Ultimately, what's really interesting is that some people can draw better from their intracellular space to maintain their blood volume when they dehydrate. So you might have somebody who loses, you know, exactly 3% of their body weight and somebody else who loses exactly 3% of their body weight in water. So they're exactly the same amount of dehydration but one individual is able to maintain the water in their bloodstream and the other individual is not. And there's a specific reason why. I'm gonna let you guys ponder this, but this is gonna be the question of the day that I ask you. Why is it that two people can dehydrate exactly the same and one person basically craps out and the other person continues to be able to perform? Right? Okay. The basis of water movement across these different compartments is dictated by a process called osmosis. And so I felt it really necessary to not only give you this big picture idea of gastrointestinal physiology and these different body compartments, this will make sense as we begin to talk about my recommendations because it's all premised on this, this very basic physiological model, is that water can move across these different spaces through a process called osmosis, right? And really, this dictates this idea called thirst, right? Um, so first and foremost, before I get into osmosis, I want you to notice that we can lose some of that water through our kidneys, through urine, we can also lose both water and sodium or sweat through our sweat glands, right? And so I wanted to come to this question of, oh, shit, sorry, of what is thirst, right? Anybody out there have an idea of what regulates how thirsty we are? Dr. Rush. How do we get thirsty? Why do we get thirsty? Oh, uh, let me think. Maybe it's your sodium getting too high. 
that's one of those variables, right? So as we sweat and we lose water, right? The concentration of the sodium in our blood rises. And that's one of the potential triggers for thirst. Um, you know, normally sodium blood is like what? 135 to 140 milliequivalents or somewhere in the 3,200 to 3,400 milligrams of sodium per liter. So if our blood gets too salty, right? Because we lose water from that bloodstream, it's a trigger for thirst. Thanks for that great answer, Dr. Rush. I wanna remind you, I want you to thirst for life, but never be thirsty. Well, I just wanna thank you for teaching me that the last time we met. <laughs> yeah. All right, so what's another trigger for thirst besides a change in the blood sodium level? You know what makes people really thirsty? Like uncontrollable thirst? And this is weird, but it makes sense. It's bleeding. So a loss of blood volume. Anytime your blood volume shrinks, that becomes another trigger for thirst, right? And so if you have someone who is experiencing a hemorrhage, depending upon whether or not they can talk to you or not, they're going to be super, super thirsty, right? So blood getting salty and losing blood are our two primary physiological drivers for thirst. Certainly there are some other kind of cues like being hot um, may play some influence, right? Um, certainly a dry mouth uh, might play some influence as well. And these are kind of other known triggers to thirst, but primarily it is that drop in blood volume or it is uh, that increase in sodium. What's really interesting is that in the studies that I've read on this phenomena during specifically exercise, during exercise, this increase in blood sodium seems to be uh, more of a trigger. With that in mind, I also want to talk about, um, let's see. I also wanted to talk about this component of, of, of your sweat, right? Because sweat can both decrease your blood volume, but it can also make your blood sodium concentration rise, right? And that's because while you might be losing some sodium, you're losing more water than you are losing sodium. Which brings me to this idea of sodium sweat loss. If our blood is about 135 to 140 milliequivalents of sodium per liter, right? 3,200 milligrams to say 3,400 milligrams of sodium per liter, right? My question for you guys is how salty is our sweat? How salty is our sweat? I've already said that it's not as salty as blood, but by how much? If blood is that, let's say just 3,300 milligrams of sodium per liter, how many milligrams of sodium do you have in a liter of sweat? If you're gonna put that in a bucket and lick it. Is that the answer on the bottom of the slide there? Uh, is it that it easy? Is. Yeah. <laughs> About a thousand milligrams of sodium per liter of sweat at a range of 400 to 2000 milligrams uh, per liter in terms of range. And, and this is the striking thing about it. You know, like we all know that we're different, right? And if I was a shoe salesman, I'd have different shoe sizes. But if you're to move some zeros over, right, just say two zeros, in order to match what different individuals lose, I'd need to keep a shoe size of four to 20 in my shop in order to be able to satisfy the genetic variability that we see with this variable. Here's what's really interesting is that as plasma moves through a sweat gland, this sweat gland actually has these 
um, little tubules within the tube that can re-sequester both sodium and chloride. And so as the sodium is rushing through this sweat gland, it's the sweat gland itself is trying to filter out or save as much salt as possible so that the salt on the other side is more dilute than blood. This is controlled by a gene set called CF1. It's actually named after the disease cystic fibrosis. What's very interesting in cystic fibrosis is they don't have an ability in their sweat gland to pull that sodium back. So they lose all of the salt in their blood out through their sweat. So a cystic fibrosis patient is characterized by a sodium sweat that is almost nearly identical to blood above 3,000 milligrams of sodium per liter. Some individuals, however, have this great ability to spare sodium. Some, not so much. On average, what comes out the other side is about 1,000 milligrams per liter, about a third of the saltiness of blood. This is super, super interesting. Um, one, because of the genetic variability, but two, because uh, this can have a big effect on not only how thirsty we get, an individual thirst mechanism, but it can also affect how water moves from the inside of cells back into our blood. And with that as a reminder, I'm gonna talk about another concept called osmosis, right? Um, you know, if this was a cartoon of the gut and we've got these different transporters that move carbohydrate across, we also have this process called osmosis where most of the water moves across. And I'm gonna get, get into that right now. You often hear when we talk about sports drinks of a concept called osmolality or, or, or osmolarity, right? And it's a measure of the molecular concentration of a solution in moles times a thousand. So this is a measure of the number of things, not a measure of mass or weight. And so here's the example I'll give you. One big person who weighs 180 pounds is one person. Even if that other person, you have another person who might say weigh 23 pounds. One really skinny person versus one big person is one person. When we talk about the molecular concentration of something, we are not talking about the mass of something. We're talking about the number of molecules of something, right? Um, another good example of this is that if you have a plane filled with a bunch of skinny people, that plane is gonna weigh less than another plane filled with a bunch of sumo wrestlers, right? The plane with the sumo wrestler is gonna have more energy in it. It's gonna have a higher caloric equivalent. But if there are 300 passengers on one plane versus 300 passengers on another plane, they have the same osmolality or osmolarity. They have the same molecular concentration, right? I often use these terms interchangeably. You can say molecular concentration, you can say osmolality, and that's the number of molecules per kilogram of fluid. You can say osmolarity, that's the number of molecules per liter. Most people use kilogram or osmolar osmolality because it's a lot easier to measure a kilogram of water than it is to measure a liter in a beaker of water, right? And so depending upon how the scientists might make the measure, in terms of how they count the molecules, is it per kilogram or per liter? That's where these two expressions come, but they're effectively the same. So long story short, we measure the molecular concentration of something by knowing how many things, not how much they weigh. But if you know how much a molecule like glucose or sugar weighs, right, and you know how much sugar in terms of mass is in it, you know how many molecules. So you can use the math if you know the mass to figure out how many molecules, as long as you know what the molecule is. Does that make sense, right? So here's the whole point. This is the gist of it. Across a semi-permeable membrane like the small intestine, okay, water will move from an area of low molecular concentration to an area of high molecular concentration, right? And remember that the small intestine, right, 
has a, sorry, has a semi-permeable membrane, right, right in it, and that the number of molecules in blood is a value of about 290 milliosmoles per kilogram. So if I were to take all of the salt, all of the substances within our, my blood, and I were to measure how many molecules there were per kilogram of blood, the value is about 280, 290, okay? What this means is that if I drink something that has a higher concentration than that, right, either those molecules have to be actively transported or water is going to move the other way into my small intestine, and that's when you get cases of diarrhea. In any case, in this model, if I've got four milliosmoles on one side and four milliosmoles on the other side, water doesn't move. But if I say add a packet of sugar, which might have 15 milliosmoles of sugar, or effectively, let's just say 15 extra molecules on one side, what ends up happening is water likes to move from the side of the lower concentration to the side with the higher concentration, so that what you end up getting is you get an equivalent concentration on both sides. And so most of water movement across not just the small intestine, but from the inside of the cell into the bloodstream is determined by this action of osmosis, okay? I'm gonna skip this. So here's what I want you guys to think about, right? I'm gonna go back to this picture here. If I'm drinking something that has, you know, a low molecular concentration, water will flow from my small intestine into my vascular space, right? But think about it also this way. If I say begin to lose a bunch of sweat, right? And there is more water than sodium, then the concentration of my blood is also going to increase, right? So I'm going to go from say 290 to say 300. And normally the number of electrolytes inside of a cell and the number of electrolytes outside of the cell are balanced. And so water is not shifting between those two spaces. But what happens if all of a sudden my blood gets more salty? What happens is that water will begin to move from inside of my cell and will begin to replace the water in my bloodstream, right? And so here's what's really interesting is that if I was a cystic fibrosis patient, okay, and I was losing the same amount of sodium as was in my blood and I lost a liter of blood, what ends up happening is my blood volume goes down, which can drive thirst. But at the same time, the concentration of my blood does not go up because what I'm losing is the same as what's in my blood. It's like having a pool and just emptying pool water out of it. But if I have a situation where I'm losing mostly water, say the pool is evaporating and the salt's not coming with it, and that concentration of sodium increases in my blood, then all of a sudden the concentration in my extracellular space, the space outside of cells, is going to be higher than the concentration, the molecular concentration of inside the cell. And it's that differential that then begins to draw water from inside of your cells into your bloodstream to maintain that plasma volume. And so to the question I asked earlier, people who lose more salt for a given amount of dehydration, they don't get as much shift of water from the inside of the cell into their blood volume. And so they end up doing worse than people who lose very little salt, right? And so what we see in the athletic world is that people who lose very little salt end up having a performance advantage when it comes to dehydration. For the same level of dehydration, they don't lose as much plasma volume. They don't lose as much blood volume, which means that they can maintain their cardiac output, which maintains they can maintain their blood pressure, which maintains it means they can maintain oxygen delivery, right? 
And so one thing I wanted to point out from the get-go is that measuring how much salt you lose or knowing that you lose a lot of salt is a pretty good indicator of how you're going to perform and that hydration versus dehydration is not just about how much water you're losing, right? Um, and that two people who lose the same amount of sodium can end up performing. Um, two people who lose different amounts of sodium can end up performing very differently from one another. So with that in mind, um, I'm just going to go over some big picture ideas around uh, hydration and fueling, and then we're just going to kind of open it up to, 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 to questions. Um, first and foremost, you know, let's talk about what the gut can handle versus let's talk about what um, might be needed in five hours of intense exercise. And let's talk about kind of what the max capacity of the, of, of the gut is. Um, in terms of water, um, on a normal day, if you're not exercising, uh, the gut will move about 10 liters of water in and out. The gut will also move about uh, 18 grams of total salt, uh, 24 grams of chloride, a uh, significant amount of potassium, four grams, um, 2,500 calories, just let's say for uh, someone who's not exercising, just, you know, hanging out. Of that, you know, on average, most people need about 60% of their fuel from carbohydrate, 20% from fat, 20% from protein. This is, you know, basic, just normal uh, dietary intake or dietary need. And that's all within the normal realm of possibility of what the, the, the gut can handle. Okay. During exercise, uh, in particular on a hot day, uh, that need could be about 10 liters uh, for the whole five hours or two liters per hour. So within five hours, you're already moving more through the gut in terms of water than what you might move in 24 hours. If sodium loss is about 1,000 milligrams on average, then you need at least 10,000 milligrams of sodium. And, and here's something that's really important, guys. The USRDA for sodium intake in a day um, is only 2,000 milligrams per hour. And if you look at normal daily absorption of sodium being 18,000, the reason that's happening is that the body itself is recirculating salt. Um, it's there, 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 there's a, there are mechanisms where um, we actually bring salt into our lumen to help with the transport of foodstuffs. And so there's this kind of circulation of sodium that's always happening in, inside of our gut. Uh, but in general, the USRDA for sodium is only 2,000 milligrams per day. But if you're losing 1,000 milligrams per liter and you're losing two liters of sweat in an hour, well, then you're needing the whole entire USRDA in an hour. And so, again, the contradiction is this, is that what we need when we're at rest is very, very different than what we need when we're active, right? Um, in terms of energy expenditure, you know, if this was an elite athlete, uh, they might be able to burn close to a thousand calories per hour, right? And you might see this in uh, really, really fit uh, soldiers, um, that their energy expenditure is close to the same. And so you're looking at a uh, pretty big turnover of, of, um, of calories, right? In terms of what they need. But whereas the need might be, say, 4,000 to 5,000, what we tend to recommend athletes actually eat for events that last up to five hours is only half of that. And that's because you have stored fat, you have stored carbohydrate, right? You have protein in terms of muscle. And so just because you burn 4,000 or 5,000 calories in an hour doesn't mean that you have to eat all of it at one time. Uh, what's more important is probably eating ahead of time so that you top off those muscle glycogen stores so that you have adequate fuel stores on board because it's pretty hard for the gut to actually absorb all of that. Um, you know, the point being that, you know, if we look at, say, how much carbohydrate that we can absorb through the gut per hour, this is probably where the bottleneck is. We can probably only absorb about 100 grams per hour, right? So storage is limited maybe to about 2,000 to 3,000 calories, depending on how much carbohydrate is in your diet and we can only bring 100 grams per hour. And carbohydrate is ultimately important because in terms of performance, we need to not just maintain 
the fuel that our muscles are using, but we also need to maintain our blood sugar so that our brains are also, um, you know, taken care of as well. So ultimately, in the context of exercise, the ultimate focus is on water, sodium, and carbohydrate. And I'm gonna pause here for a little bit and just talk a little bit about um, some of the recommendations that I see on both the hydration and on the fueling side with the general background that I've given you. With the general background that I've given you, first and foremost, when it comes to hydration, the first piece of advice that I'm gonna give you guys is that you have to drink to thirst and not beyond, okay? It sounds really, really simplistic, but if thirst controls two variables, it controls to some degree during exercise blood volume, but it's also controlled by the electrolyte balance. What we know is this, is that being out of electrolyte balance or having a diluted sodium during exercise probably leads to more negative consequences than dehydration, okay? When athletes drink beyond their thirst, they end up diluting out that blood sodium. They get this phenomenon called hyponatremia. And that hyponatremia can lead to all sorts of crazy signs and symptoms. You can lose coordination. You can feel really fatigued. Uh, you can get sick. You can become incontinent. Uh, there are all manners of really bad things that happen when your blood electrolyte dips too low. And really, the only way for your blood electrolyte levels to dip too low is if you over drink, right? Or if you have some, say, other hormonal problem or kidney problem where you're retaining just too much water in your system um, and not enough salt, right? So first and foremost, drink to thirst, right? Here's what's really interesting though, is if you are drinking plain water to thirst and you're losing some salt out of the body, right? And what's gonna end up happening is that you don't have to drink as much water to keep the concentration the same because there's no longer as much salt as there is in the body. And so one of the unfortunate things that happens with plain water is that with plain water, if you're drinking the thirst and that thirst mechanism is working and you're keeping your blood sodium normal, well, the only way that you can keep it normal is for either your blood volume to drop, right? Or your total body water to drop, right? So you effectively dehydrate. The easiest way to counteract that is to actually consume the sodium that you lose in your sweat, right? So as a whole, knowing how variable sodium loss is across the population, what I always tell athletes to do is always start with at least, say 800 milligrams to 1000 milligrams of sodium for every liter of water that you drink. And if you do that and you drink to thirst, what's really, really great is that the body is super good at taking care of itself. And when you do that across the population, you see very, very little dehydration and you see almost no hyponatremia, right? It's pretty much that simple. Drink to thirst, consume at least 800 to 1,000 milligrams of sodium per liter of what you drink and the body will self-regulate. On hot days, you'll end up wanting to drink more. On cooler days, you'll end up drinking less. It's too hard to figure out or calculate how different environments impact this. And so listening to your intuition is probably the best way to go when it comes to this, you know, hydration. What happens if you are someone who doesn't lose a lot of salt is that if you're consuming too much sodium, you'll just end up retaining a little more water in your bloodstream, right? Um, the risk of that are far less, especially in the context of exercise 
than going the other way. And so what we tend to find is that if we actually give an athlete in the field an excess amount of salt, which drives their thirst, we see an increase in plasma volume and we see less urination, which means they're holding on to more of that water. And what we also see is that performance goes up, right? Um, the only bad outcome is that you might be a little bloated and you might not look as swole, right? Um, I've actually had athletes complain when we use a regime of high salt on time trial days or high performance days that they don't like doing it because they can't see their veins anymore, right? Because uh, they're holding on to so much water. But that uh, vanity play is far less important than the performance gain. Okay. The next thing to know, at least on the hydration side from this, is that having some carbohydrate in your solution along with that salt is going to cause more water absorption than drinking plain water, right? So not only do you have an advantage with respect to maintaining that blood volume, but you also have an advantage in terms of water absorption, right? Um, one thing that I will touch upon is this, is that when you think about sports drinks, you're mainly thinking about sodium. You're not thinking about potassium. And the reason you're not thinking about potassium is because you're not losing much of any potassium in your sweat. And you're not losing much of any potassium in your sweat because there's very little potassium in your bloodstream. Remember, most of the potassium is inside of cells, okay? So what's very interesting is that if I drink something with a lot of sodium in it, I end up getting more water in my extracellular space. Right, and this is why often doctors, if you are hypertensive and you have high blood pressure issues, they'll tell you to decrease the amount of sodium in your diet because they're trying to reduce the amount of uh, water in your bloodstream, right, to bring down your blood pressure. On the other hand, if I were to drink a solution like coconut water with a ton of potassium in it, right, that potassium is going to be transported inside of my cells. It's going to increase the molecular concentration of potassium inside of the cells. Water is going to follow. And so having something with a lot of potassium in it is going to increase intracellular water stores. Okay. What you end up seeing with like an oral rehydration solution like Pedialyte is that it typically has about 500 milligrams of potassium and 1500 milligrams of sodium. So that what you end up getting is you get some water drawing into the intracellular space, but you get most of that water into the extracellular space. That extra sodium also helps with water transport across the gut along with a little bit of sugar. But unlike Pedialyte, what you see in a sports drink is you see something that is focused way more on sodium than it is on potassium because sodium is what you're losing in sweat. Does that make sense in terms of a distinction between those two products. So while oral rehydration solutions are really, really good for rehydrating after the fact or rehydrating when you're sick or rehydrating in general, sports drinks that focus primarily on sodium are what you want when you're actually sweating, okay? So that's kind of the hydration story. Um, as far as the fueling story and how much carbohydrate you might need, the reason why we focus so much on carbohydrate is because our fat stores are primarily unlimited and that as long as we maintain a little bit of carbohydrate in, we can prevent ourselves from catalyzing protein, which is super, super important. And usually it's the carbohydrate that's the bottleneck and it's the carbohydrate that's the bottleneck because when we run out of carbohydrate, it becomes harder for us to maintain our blood sugar. And when it becomes harder for us to maintain our blood sugar, it becomes harder for us to protect our nervous system. And usually during exercise, when our blood sugar dips, we don't quit because we're out of fuel. We quit because our brains say we're feeling hypoglycemic or because we can no longer kind of maintain control of our body, right? And so carbohydrate 
ends up being really, really important, if only to keep your blood sugar up, if only to keep your cognitive capacity up, and if only to help uh, continuing to burn the fat that we need for, you know, say long, steady uh, amounts of work. But since carbohydrate um, is limited in terms of, it, of its absorption, and because taking in too much carbohydrate once can increase the molecular concentration inside our intestine, and that in turn can cause some GI distress because now you have something with a very high concentration of, of, of fluid inside your gut. What we tend to recommend is that you eat your food so that you can use your stomach as a big reservoir and the digestion process slowly trickles things in. Um, it's either that or you know, using very, very complex carbohydrates that digest more slowly. Uh, we recently came out with a product called uh, highly branched cyclic dextrin uh, that uh, digests very slowly where athletes can actually drink their fuel. Otherwise, it's all about consistent eating. Uh, with that in mind, I'll go over some, some final recommendations and then we'll just uh, open it up to questions. Eat your fuel, drink your hydration. If you can't eat solid food during exercise, um, right? Solid, solid food ultimately has a slower gastric emptying rate uh, over the long haul. This prevents a traffic jam from happening. It allows calories to always be trickling in so that it doesn't impede hydration. Um, you got to ask yourself, is the bottleneck hydration fuel or neither? I think that what I tend to see with most athletes and with most people in the field is that hydration tends to be a bitter bo bottleneck than fuel. If you are eating normally, um, Drinking a sports drink, even with a little bit of calories, is sufficient enough to maintain your blood sugar for two to three hours, and food isn't always all that necessary. Uh, what that means is that you probably, if you know you're going to go work out, if you know you're going on an operation, have a big meal about three hours beforehand so that you have enough time to onboard that fuel, you have enough time for insulin to clear your blood sugar. Um, and for your blood sugar to stabilize before you go out. Otherwise, the best thing to do if you haven't had a proper meal is just start eating something when you begin exercise um, and you'll probably be good to go. So you gotta replace what you lose, right? You gotta figure out what that loss is in terms of carbohydrate, water, and sodium. Um, most people I find tend to overconsume relative to their needs during exercise. Um, what's interesting is that in colder temperatures, right? Your reliance on water is going to be less, your reliance on sodium is going to be less, but your carbohydrate reliance is probably going to be uh, the same. So when it's colder, what I tend to find is that we tend to bring less fluid out, but we bring more solid food out. And then when it's hotter, because athletes are drinking so much more, we tend to bring less food out, but we keep the concentration of carbohydrate fairly low. And they make up that calorie, those calories in, in volume of drink. Um, so, you know, you can get your calories in either liquid or solid form. In the heat, it's easier to get it in low concentration form because you're drinking a lot more. In cold weather, we kind of go opposite. And then finally, you know, one last caveat I'll give you guys with respect to sports nutrition is that so much of our hydration needs, our fluid needs, are predicated on us staying, um, trying to thermoregulate or abating sweat loss. Logistically, sometimes it's really hard to get the right concentration in. Um, so what I tend to find is that simply staying cool um, or finding techniques to keep people cool can really decrease how much we have to give them in terms of drink, right? Um, so I tend to prioritize thermoregulation and staying cool as much as I try to prioritize what I give these athletes to drink to replace sweat loss. Um, and what's also interesting is that metabolically, we just work better when we're cool. We begin to really shut down when we're hot. Um, and when we're hot, Another thing that happens is that small semi-permeable membrane in the intestine, it starts to break down. And so it becomes really, really hard to eat and stay fueled in the field if you're too hot. 
we just don't absorb very well, right? Our, our gut can literally become leaky, right? Um, often the fastest way to cool down is to slow down, right? And so pace is everything, staying in shade is everything, you know, uh, wicking fabrics um, have been shown with a high rate of evaporation have been shown to cool better. Um, and also proper heat adaptation go, can go a long way to protecting your gut and enhancing thermal regulation. And so if you know you're being deployed to a really hot environment, getting in a hot sauna two or three times a week, six weeks before you get deployed to that hot environment ends up being really, really, really important because not only is there an overall adaptation to heat in terms of you know how you sweat, the amount of sodium you sweat, your volume of sweat, um, but there's also adaptation within the gut that helps you to continue to absorb food better when you're hot. Uh, and that's pretty much all I've got, guys. Amazing. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Lim. I mean, that was, I'm really excited for the, uh, the questions portion, um, for what the audience has, but just want to congratulate you on your new technology of rehydration, uh, fuel talking about that yeah, dextrin and then, uh, congratulate you on that, the new uniforms that your, your team developed for the athletes as well. So th I think that's going to be great. Um, and seeing that, seeing that going. So congratulations yeah. from everybody. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, with respect to the Q and A, I can talk more specifically about just things that are concerning you. And I just wanted to give you guys some, some very broad background. Um, and we'll go from there. Sorry, I took up so much time. That was awesome. I don't think anybody has any complaints. They all stuck it out. So uh, I'm going to regulate the, the questions for everybody uh, to help you out, Dr. Lim, so you don't get uh, barricaded. So from the CEO of SOMC, Josh Perez, he texted me on the side. And I see his wife just texted too. Um, what is the best way for people on long missions to get carbohydrates in, say on target? So I, I think the best way, first and foremost, prioritize your hydration first, right? And if there's a little bit of carbohydrate, and when I say a little bit of carbohydrate, I'm talking about four grams of carbohydrate per 100 mils of fluid. Um, that gives you in a small 16 ounce water bottle about 80 to 100 calories, right? If you're always trickling in a fluid with salt and carbohydrate in, you'll be surprised by how much fuel you can actually get in with just a low concentration of carbohydrate. And so this is where, you know, I think, uh, a sports drink does work really, really well. And where I will always say that uh, water solution with a little bit of carbohydrate and plenty of sodium, about a thousand milligrams of sodium per liter is always going to be more effective than plain water because you'll not only stay hydrated, but you'll always get a little bit of trickle of carbohydrate that will keep your blood sugar level. I think that beyond that, two things are really important. One is that People tend to focus, what can I eat when I'm, when I'm you know, out on a mission? But really, the carbohydrate that you consume in the week leading up to that is super, super important because the amount of carbohydrate you store in muscle as muscle glycogen can be highly variable. It can change from being 1,000 calories to up to 3,000 calories depending upon how much carbohydrate you eat. And if you really want to max out your carbohydrate stores for at least one week before a particular event, you need to be consuming at least 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight a day to top off those glycogen stores. And topping off those glycogen stores will greatly impact how much you need to eat when you're on a particular mission. Finally, it's all about being prepared, right? So when I talk about being a highly educated nanny, a big part of my job was making little tiny portable energy bars for the athletes before they got deployed or before, sorry, before they went out into the field so that they would always have some source of real food uh, for them to satiate their needs and to, you know, depending upon their energy expenditure, focusing on replacing about half the calories that you burn. A good way to think about how many calories you burn is to know that for every mile that you walk or run, as a rule of thumb across the population, you're burning about 100 calories. 
right? So you need at least 50 calories for every mile that you're gonna traverse. And if you're using a little step counter, that's a simple way to get a sense of, well, how many calories do I need to be optimized? And either you've got to cook that food ahead of time and pack that away. Um, I've written with Chef Bijou Thomas, a cookbook called Feed Zone Portables that has a ton of these different recipes. But if you're in a situation where you can't bring real food, um, you know, obviously there are plenty of energy bars out there that you can use, right? And you can just count the calories there and figure out what you want to, what you want to, what you want to bring. Uh, but we also released this new product called uh, Super Fuel, which is made out of a really, really complex carbohydrate called highly branched cyclic dextrin that tends to digest more like real food. And we have found with that particular carbohydrate, athletes can put about 100 grams of carbohydrate in a 17 ounce water bottle, and they can trickle that in throughout the day to make sure that they're getting enough carbohydrate. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I know a lot of guys like to carry their now jeans with them on their kit or they'll walk camelback or some sort. So I think introducing the carbohydrate into that, uh, besides just the sodium would be beneficial for our guys that are on target or on long missions. That's right. It's just salt and carbs. It's, it's kind of that simple and you drink and fuel to taste and off, off of feel. And generally speaking that, that it, it works out so long as you have what you need, right? Like it's not going to work if you get really hungry, your blood sugar decreases and you don't have the supplies you need. So maybe the whole story here is just being prepared more than anything. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so in the chat also, so Mike Turconi, he's actually our international liaison um, and one of our favorite resident Italians. He said, do you have any suggestions for makeshift solutions for optimal hydration in the field? So say so you don't have a scratch lab a product that's available, of course. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the simplest hack is just using plain old table sugar so about 20 grams, which is maybe big, two big tablespoons, right? For every half liter bottle. And to that, you just add, you know, a thousand milligrams of sodium. Um, you can use regular table salt. Uh, I tend to find that sodium citrate or sodium bound to deacidified fruit acid works better. It's just easier on the gut and it tastes better than, than, than salt. Uh, but you can also make up that salt in the food you eat. So if you're Italian, just, you know, bring some prosciutto with you. Yeah, and, Mike. You know, put a little sugar in your water and you'll be okay. And here's the thing is that, well, that sounds like just really simple advice. It works, right? It's not something that you want to do when you're just sitting around playing video games all day. But if you are sweating and working hard, that, that, simple table sugar can be so ergogenic and it doesn't have to be more complex than that. Uh, certainly, you know, you can use more complex starches and sugars out there, but if it's a, if you keep it at a low concentration, it's unlikely to cause any GI distress. And finally, you know, squeeze a little lemon or lime in it and you got yourself like the perfect sports drink. And that's a bench, essentially how I used to make the sports drinks for the riders in the Tour de France. We would just make our own using, huh you know, sodium citrate using cane sugar and using real fruit for flavor. And that's essentially all scratches. Um, I used to give the formula away to everyone and it only became a business because people were too lazy to make it themselves. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I know guys like Mike and some other girls and guys on this chat really appreciate that answer because they go to a lot of these countries um, like John John up there with the red hat on and, and they do a lot of this outreach to the citizens who suffer from cholera or they suffer from poor access to clean water or poor access to nutrition. So that answer you just gave is going to have a really big impact for those guys and girls who go to those countries. So thank you. Yeah. One thing um, to think about if you're actually dealing with a cholera outbreak or dealing with dysentery or anything like that in a population is that um, as long as you have a little bit of carbohydrate, as long as it's salty, maybe a little bit of zinc as well, um, you go a long way to creating a really good oral rehydration solution. And uh, that's, that's the basis of it, right? So even just like a rice porridge, a salty rice porridge will work really well. We make an oral rehydration solution. Uh, we call it wellness. And I know that we sent a bunch out to, 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 to some folks in the field. Uh, if you guys ever need that stuff, um, we mostly just give it away uh, for situations where there are kind of 
you know, outbreaks. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. I know SOMC, we've been talking, leading up to this webinar, we all talk about how much we all use Scratch products. So we definitely appreciate that. Um, and we love your stuff. But again, from Josh, he has another question. Uh, do people with prior heat injuries, uh, do they require more sodiums or fluids post uh, as they've uh, recovered, like fully recovered from their heat injury? Now they're exercising again, going back to missions. Maybe, if, if only to try to keep them safe. But you know, heat injuries can happen for a lot of different reasons. And a heat injury can happen unrelated to your hydration status, right? Uh, it's just, you got too hot for whatever, for, for whatever reason. I mean, it could be the gear that you had on the clothing. It could have been, you know, the external temperature that was kind of out of your control and uh, heat illnesses and heat injuries can happen in a very short time frame and not necessarily be related to uh, some change in your electrolyte balance or your total water uh, balance. You can get plenty hot and get injured and still, you know, have plenty of total water on board, right? Um, uh, that being said, if it is a heat injury uh, caused by, you know, classic dehydration and not getting enough fluid, not getting enough sodium, one question to ask is, am I somebody who loses an excess amount of sodium, right? And is that what might be impairing my performance um, and one easy way to account for that that is very pragmatic is that you can weigh yourself before and after a bout of exercise, okay? If you are satiating your thirst with whatever, you, whatever it happens to be that you're drinking and you find that compared to others that you might be working out with, you are losing a lot more body weight because of water loss, right? and you're also finding that your performance is suffering, then what you need to do is incrementally increase your sodium intake during the next bout of exercise or the next bouts of exercise. And if that increase in sodium decreases how much water you lose or how much weight you lose in that bout of exercise, then you've kind of self-calibrated to knowing that you probably lose more sodium, right? So you can run a little experiment on yourself measure your weight loss before and post. If you're not losing a lot of weight and you have no issues, stick to whatever you're doing. But if you're losing a lot of body weight, my advice is to incrementally increase the sodium you're intaking. And you might find that you need a lot more salt out there in the field than others. Gotcha. Um, from Meredith, she's a ultra runner and then she's also one of our SOMPC soft medic members. She wants to know what your thoughts are on fasted workouts and fasted training. I think that there's some merit to it. I think that those fasted workouts can help with uh, improving uh, fat utilization and a lot of the adaptations that happen with fat use. Um, I will be clear in saying that it decreases the amount of work that you do. So specificity is still everything when it comes to creating a maximal adaptation. You can allocate some of workouts where you're just doing low steady intensity to improve that fat burning mechanism um, to, you know, try to help, you know, with, with, with uh, body weight loss, et cetera, things of this nature, but there still needs to be that very high intensity or very specific uh, training that allows you to, to still do high intensity when it's required in the field. Right. So, um, yeah, mix it up. And I, and I think that that's great. And in the training programs that, that we, that I use for athletes, there is almost always some period of time where we do a lot of kind of calorically restricted workouts. Um, but there are also plenty of times, especially as we get in the competition where we are loading up on the carbohydrate and we're leaning, uh, we're leaning into that high intensity work pretty heavily. Uh, from one of our other prosciutto brothers here, Nick, uh, he wants to know if there are, uh, is there a concentration of sugar that would be on average too much causing fluid shift, having a bad impact to our performance? So too, is there too much sugar? Yeah, I would say that when you get past 10 grams of sugar per hundred mils, so you're talking about 50 grams in a half liter bottle, that, that probably is, uh, a, a little too much. Um, that being said, it's usually not the sugar 
concentration that screws people up. It's usually all the other extra ingredients in a sports drink that screws people up. So the emulsifiers, the coloring agents, the flavoring agents, all of those things are also molecules, right? The nice thing about sugar is that sugar can be transported across the gut, right? And so if you were to make a solution and it was just sugar and salt, maybe a little squeeze of lemon in it, that will probably cause way less GI distress, even if the concentration is above blood, because over time, dynamically, the gut's going to be removing that sugar and bringing it into the bloodstream, lowering the concentration, right? And so you have both osmosis happening that is causing water movement, but you also have active transport that in real time is decreasing the osmolality or the molecular pressure inside of the gut. And as long as you stick to real food ingredients, you can experiment and probably push the envelope higher than if you were to use prepackaged products with the same number of calories, because those prepackaged products are always going to have extra molecules that are probably um, not well transported by the gut. Gotcha. Uh, from Scott Kimball, I know you guys have talked before. He says, Alan, you spoke, uh, spoke to Pedialyte. Can you speak to or compare scratch products to Drip Drop and Sarah Sport? Yeah, so those other products like Drip Drop, they tend to be uh, very similar to Pedialyte, right? So they're higher sodium solutions, they're higher potassium solutions. Uh, they tend to work really well for general hydration, especially if you're severely dehydrated or cases of illness. Um, we have three hydration products at Scratch. We have our wellness product, which is essentially just like Pedialyte, except without all the, the extra ingredients, right? So none of the emulsifiers, none of the coloring agents, none of the flavoring agents, and all of that creates a lower osmolality for a drink. So we know that in that category, um, we have the lowest... We have the same nutrient panel at a lower osmolality because we're not adding excess ingredients. And that's the main distinguisher between our oral rehydration solution and the oral rehydration solutions made by say Drip Drop and Pedialyte. Effectively, all of us are using the recipe set forth by the World Health Organization. So the World Health Organization, every five years or so, releases updates to oral rehydration solution formulas. And almost every company that makes a drink in this category simply just follows exactly what who tells us to do, right? So very little difference except for taste and except for whether or not you're adding excess ingredients to the product. These oral rehydration solutions, again, 1,500 milligrams of sodium, 500 milligrams of potassium per liter, about 10 milligrams of zinc per liter, which is a requirement of who, right? The zinc helps with the intestinal viruses and about two to 3% carbohydrate, meaning two to three grams of glucose per 100 mils. That's the mandate right now. Aside from our oral rehydration solution, we also have our sports drink, which is 800 milligrams of sodium, four grams of carbohydrate from fructose and glucose. Um, and just freeze-dried fruit for flavor. And then finally, we have something called hyperhydration, which is basically our drink uh, at 3,500 milligrams. So it's a saline drink. It's like drinking a bag of saline. We use that before events to increase the amount of blood volume before individuals go out. I'm gonna plug my computer in really quick. Anytime. Yeah. John, John, you think that volume expansion is like legal blood doping? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That's, I'm down. That's just, yeah, you can, you, can either, you can either put can we do both? Or, Why not both? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You guys aren't regulated by USADA. You know, it's fine. Uh, yeah, so we, we have those three drinks. That hyperhydration drink is really, really important. We see a lot of improvement because you can't always carry the salt and the water you need when you're in the field. And so by drinking uh, a liter of it before you go out, you end up retaining more fluid, especially in your plasma. You end up peeing less of it out and it can really, really help 
um, if you are onboarding that extra water and sodium before you got out in the field. And so on really, really hot days, our typical protocol is for athletes to drink about a liter of this saline level solution or hyperhydration in the evening before they go to bed. They'll drink another half liter at breakfast and then they'll drink between half a liter to a liter before the race event or before the workout. And doing those things really does top off their fluids. It uh, especially tops off the fluid in the extracellular space. It makes them feel at times a bit bloated. And if it's um, really hot, it's great. If it ends up turning cool, they tend to end up peeing out the, that excess volume, right? So temperature does matter in terms of this protocol and it doesn't tend to work very well when it's cold out, but it works really well when it's super hot out. Awesome. Um, another question from Meredith is, uh, besides sodium water and glucose, are there other micros uh, that can cause significant decrease in performance or have an athlete crash, experience a crash? Um, yeah, you know, I mean, there's, there, there, there's some thought as to whether or not you need a certain amount of branching amino acids or any protein. I tend to think that maybe, maybe not. Um, we tend to, you know, like say at the Tour de France, what I found, and this was just a hack that I did one day at the hotel. I, I threw a bunch of the leftover eggs and bacon from the hotel buffet into a big bowl of sushi rice. And I made these bacon and egg rice cakes. And it all of a sudden became a standard. And all of a sudden it was kind of like, holy cow, is bacon like performance enhancing during exercise? <laughs> I mean, certainly based upon the consumption in the Tour de France when I was working at the tour, you would think so. Um, but no, as long as blood sugar is stable, um, as long as your electrolyte balance is there, as long as your plasma volume or your blood volume is stable, uh, in theory, you are good to go, right? Um, I do think though that, you know, one of the biggest reasons why we quit in the field is because of thermal regulation. And so that's another kind of confounding factor. So if you get too hot, it really doesn't matter, you know, what you've done on the nutrition side, you, you will, your body will quit. You, you, it will force you to slow, slow down. So in terms of the macros, that's it. Gotcha. I, I hate I to say it's that simple but you can have a lot of really great creative solutions to that. And you can give yourself permission to have a lot of different types of delicious foods when you're out there exercising. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Um, send them. Okay. I don't see any other questions going around, going once, going twice. Five second rule like Dr. Lim says. All right, um, Dr. Lim, we cannot thank you enough for joining us on this webinar. Um, we do these monthly, so we try and bring experts in their field onto, uh, onto the service for our members for free. And to be able to have your time uh, for this audience has been incredible. Like you agreed to, we're gonna, it's been recorded, so we'll, we'll post it to YouTube and we'll let you know before that goes live. Um, we just thank you very much once again for supporting our nonprofit and supporting our members. Uh, well, I know a lot of the guys are gonna take this straight straight to their field, straight to their teams. So it's going to be good. Thank, thank you all for all you do. Um, you know, you guys all qualify for our industry site, which, you know, effectively gives you half off on anything. And then if any of you have groups that want to order in bulk, uh, we could probably cut you a, a deal and get you guys uh, stuff out there in the field. Um, at least with the military, you know, you tend to have U.S. addresses, even if you're deployed overseas. So uh, shipping is maybe still takes a while, but it's a, a lot easier. And really the, the only international accounts we can really uh, kind of take care of are you guys. So uh, it works out pretty well. Heck yeah. And because at SOMC, we believe in the best medicine, the best products, buy Scratch Labs products if you want the best stuff. <laughs> so I'll give you a plug there. Um, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to close yeah. out the chat here, everybody. Okay. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Lim.